Hello and welcome to this short video about the limbic system from the Swansea University Medical School. My name is Professor Phil Newton and what we're going to do in this video is talk in an introductory way about where the limbic system is and what it does. What I hope you're able to do then by the end of this video is to be able to identify the main components of the limbic system, describe their main functions and talk about how they're wired in to other parts of the central nervous system and elsewhere. Before we get into the limbic system, we do have to very briefly revise some basic core principles of sensory processing. Here are the four main lobes of the brain and the outer cortical regions are named as follows. We've got the parietal cortex there in yellow, the temporal cortex in green, the frontal cortex in blue, and the occipital cortex, the visual cortex, there at the back. Very simplistically, what these cortical regions do when we're processing new sensory information is as follows. The parietal cortex will tell us where new sensory information is coming from. The temporal cortex will tell us what it is, and the frontal cortex will figure out what to do about it. Like I said, this is a very, very simplistic overview of sensory processing, but it's sufficient for us to be able to understand how this is all wired into the limbic system. There's a fourth component then, which is the limbic system, important for understanding how we respond to incoming sensory information. Here it is shown in red, and if we were to try and summarize what it does very simplistically, it tells us how we feel about new incoming sensory information. It's responsible in large part for generating emotions and feelings and how we're integrating those with how we respond to new sensory information and to our behavior in general. We know this in part because patients who experience temporal lobe epilepsy will experience very strong, very distorted emotional set states. This then is so the so-called limbic system. And before we get into the detail of it, I do have to give you a health warning about the basic principles of this video. Many people will tell you that the limbic system does not actually exist as a functional system. I know, I know. Why are we doing a video about a system if it doesn't exist? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. The first is that Lots of textbooks and instructional materials will tell you that the limbic system is a thing. Lots of medical school and other health professions curricula, even neuroscience curricula, will contain sections on the limbic system. The idea of a limbic system, a so-called emotion system, is just a little bit out of date. It was originally proposed as a system for processing and responding to and generating emotions. We now know that emotions in particular, fear and other emotions, are much more complicated than the simple components of the limbic system. However, as an idea, it persists in the same way that the Pape circuit persists or the triune brain persists. We'll talk about those in other videos. It's also a really good excuse for me to tell you about some really important parts of the brain and what they do and where they are. So we're going to stick with it for now. Okay. Here then are some of those parts of the brain. You can see them here in the various different colors and we're going to talk through them one by one. We're going to start with the amygdala, talk about the hippocampus. We'll briefly mention the cingulate and the corpus callosum. We'll talk at the end about the thalamus and also the hypothalamus. And we're going to spend most of our time talking about those regions which have a distinct and discrete function, in particular the amygdala and the hippocampus. Let's start then with the amygdala. Take a second to just watch through the three-dimensional video and get an idea of where the amygdala is. Here then are some still shots from that same video, and you can see that from an anatomical perspective, the amygdala is kind of located just sort of on the end of the chordate, which is somewhat misleading because it doesn't really tell us a lot about what the amygdala does. You can see that it's propped up on top of the hippocampus, and that's perhaps more important from a functional perspective. If we had to sum up in one word what it is the amygdala does, we'd probably have to use the word fear. Now, this is one of the areas where the idea of the limbic system and its components is a little bit out of date. A very basic summary of what the amygdala does is generate fear, but it is more complicated than that. If we stimulate the amygdala experimentally, particularly in experimental animal models, it does promote and provoke fear and aggression. It's also responsible for what we might call vigilance. That's paying attention to external stimuli, cues in our environment that might be associated with fear. The amygdala is very important for recognizing fear in other people. People who have bilateral damage to the amygdala or problems with the function of the amygdala find it difficult to tell when somebody else is afraid. Perhaps most importantly, the amygdala is responsible in part for learning about fear. Probably also important for learning about things that are not fearful. It's more important perhaps as a general principle to think of the amygdala as being part of the circuits that are responsible for learning about cues in our environment that are associated with particular emotional states. 
Fear is obviously a very important one of those from an evolutionary perspective, and that's perhaps part of the reason why we think about the amygdala as being responsible for learning about and responding to cues associated with fear. From a clinical perspective, the amygdala is then considered to be very important in anxiety disorders. It's hyperactive in certain anxiety disorders, and it's considered to be responsible for some of the emotional states we know as hypervigilance in things like post-traumatic stress disorder. People are overly attentive to cues in their environment that might be associated with something bad, something fearful happening. There is a clinical situation that results from bilateral lesions of the amygdala, and that's known as kluver beauty syndrome. kluver beauty syndrome is very rare, and if you think back to where the amygdala is, there are obviously two different sets of amygdala nuclei, one in the left hemisphere, one in the right hemisphere, and they're very far apart from each other. And so to have very specific bilateral lesions or damage to the amygdala is very rare. Nevertheless, where this happens, people show the following signs and symptoms. Reduced fear and docility, visual agnosia, pica, that's putting inappropriate things in their mouth, hyperorality, and hypersexuality. As with many of the components of the limbic system, the amygdala is not a straightforward single unitary body. It's a collection of different subregions. Each of those regions does slightly different things, but that will be the subject of a different video later on. We're going to give you a very specific example of what the amygdala does. This is the sort of thing that the amygdala helps us learn about. Okay, so that sound, if you think about it from a purely objective perspective, it is just a bang. It doesn't have anything particular associated with it. If we had never heard the sound of gunfire, it would just sound like a loud bang. But to most of us who've seen films, or those of us who've experienced the sound of gunfire, they will know that that is the sound of a weapon being fired. If we are exposed to that in a hostile situation, let's say we're involved in combat and someone is firing shots at us, that's associated with an imminent risk of our death or serious injury, then we're going to learn very quickly that that sound means bad things are going to happen or bad things are happening. That learning, that association between the gunfire and bad things happening, that's what the amygdala is doing. It's making that association. It's responsible for some of the basic neuroscience of basic Pavlovian conditioning, learning about bad things and then generating an emotional response to them when we encounter them again later on so that we know to avoid them. From an evolutionary perspective, that obviously makes a lot of sense. We want to learn very quickly and very strongly about things that are associated with an imminent risk of us dying or undergoing serious injury. The amygdala helps us do that and so we avoid them in the future. It's important to say that although we've used a very extreme example here of gunfire and imminent death, the amygdala is involved in generating and responding to and learning about all different types of fear. Let's talk briefly then about the cingulate gyrus. It's a big part of the limbic system. It's quite a big part of the brain. It does some very important things to do with learning and memory. But from a functional perspective, it doesn't have a discrete, specific function that is unique only to it. So we're not going to talk about it in great detail here. You can see from an anatomical perspective where it is. We're also not going to talk in detail about the corpus callosum. Many of you will already know that's the white matter tract that connects the two hemispheres. It's fundamentally important. It's not really a part of the limbic system in terms of its function. It doesn't have similar functions to many of the other regions, but it's a useful anatomical marker to figure out whereabouts the cingulate and all the other regions are. We're going to talk in a bit more detail, though, about the hippocampus. Let me show you where it is. Now let's talk about what the hippocampus does. And if we had to try and sum it up in one word, that word would be memory. Now again, as with the amygdala, it isn't as simple as that. The hippocampus is lots of different subregions doing slightly different things. And even when you consider them all together, the hippocampus isn't responsible solely for learning and memory. There are lots of other parts of the brain that are important for learning and memory. But the hippocampus is fundamental to memory, and in particular, declarative or explicit memory. This is the sort of memory for facts and figures, the sorts of things we think of as when we try and remember something, when we try and learn something. A lot of the famous literature about the hippocampus and what it does comes from a, a very famous patient in psychology called patient HM, with bilateral damage to his hippocampus as a result of a surgical procedure. Patient HM could not lay down new memories, and so he lived his life in a 30-second bubble. The hippocampus, though, does something else that's really important. It tells it where you are in space. It tells you where you are in the world relative to other things. 
Another way of saying this is that the hippocampus is important for spatial memory. It's also important for learning about where you are in space, and learning about where things are relative to each other. This is particularly important in the posterior and dorsal hippocampus, and there are some very celebrated studies showing that people who've had to learn to drive taxis before the age of GPS had slightly larger posterior hippocampus, and this was thought to be in part because they had a much greater spatial knowledge, and the learning of that spatial knowledge caused the hippocampus to increase in volume ever so slightly. There you are, that's the famous example. The way that the hippocampus does this is it has what we might call place cells. That is, there are specific neurons or groups of neurons in the hippocampus that fire when you are in a particular place. So wherever you are now, if you're watching this at home or you're sitting in the library, you have place cells that are firing that are telling you this is where I am. I am in my home or I am in the library. When you leave wherever you are and you go to a different room in your house or a different room in the university, different sets of place cells will fire to tell you that you are now in a slightly different place. The hippocampus is really important clinically, in part because it's one of the first sites that's lost in Alzheimer's disease, and this explains a lot about some of the memory deficits that are an early sign of Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. The hippocampus is often a focus for epilepsy. It's often where certain types of epilepsy start. The hippocampus is also a really important site for neurogenesis, the generation of new neurons. Certain drugs, in particular some SSRI, some antidepressants, are thought to work in part by stimulating neurogenesis in the hippocampus and elsewhere. We'll mention briefly the fornix. That wasn't on our initial slide, but it's important for telling us about how certain parts of the limbic system are connected together. Here again is the hippocampus, and you can see as it sweeps up and around the back there, it turns into and is connected to the fornix. The fornix is shown here, and it's very basically the part of the brain that connects the hippocampus to the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is a really important part of the limbic system, and it's in many ways the output of the limbic system. The amygdala and the hippocampus are very strongly wired into the hypothalamus. Here then is the hypothalamus, and if you've been following the previous images and previous animations, you can see that the fornix and other regions are now connected into this little red region at the front here. What does the hypothalamus do? It's the bridge between the nervous system, in particular the brain, and the endocrine system. It's wired then on into the pituitary, the brainstem, and the autonomic system. All of these are regions which are responsible for generating feelings at a very basic physiological level in terms of speeding up or slowing down our heart, for example. The pituitary in particular produces hormones in response to information that comes from the hypothalamus. The commands from the hypothalamus themselves then come from information sent to them by the amygdala, the hippocampus, and so on. Hypothalamus is really important for things like thermoregulation, hunger, thirst, and many other basic physiological states. It produce, produces either the hormones that cause these states or the commands that cause other regions to produce the hormones and other physiological changes that produce these states and then generate, in part, a response to them. Now I'm now going to give you an example of these three regions of the brain working together and together with other regions of the brain to regulate some important everyday behaviours. Remember how the amygdala is responsible for forming the association between the sound of gunfire and something bad happening, a useful evolutionary response which allows us to avoid things that might result in us becoming harmed or damaged. That same sound, though, as you remember, doesn't have any actual harm-causing properties of its own. It's only when we learn to associate it with being shot at that it becomes important. We might encounter a similar sound later on in our life. Let's say we have been involved in combat. Let's say it was a very aversive experience and we were shot at and we learned to associate the sound of gunfire with something bad happening. Then we experience that same sound in a completely different context. Let's say we go to a firework display and we hear sounds that sound a lot like gunfire. Our amygdala lights up and tells us, remember that sound? That's the sound of something bad happening. Something bad is about to happen. We should get away. It's our hippocampus that tells us where we are in the world. Our hippocampus that tells us there's no need to be afraid. The sound is the same, yes, but the context in which we're experiencing the sound is different. We're at a fireworks display. We're in a different country. We're not being fired at. It's okay. The prefrontal cortex, as we'll see in other videos, then mediates the difference between these two regions of the brain, tells the hippocampus, you win, amygdala, you be quiet. It's okay. We're at a fireworks display.
The hypothalamus is, of course, working with all of these regions. If the amygdala wins out in that discussion, as it does in people with post-traumatic stress disorder, then it tells the hypothalamus to produce all of the physiological changes that are associated with a fearful response. If the hippocampus wins out, then it doesn't. All right, finally, what we're going to talk about very briefly is the thalamus. Here it is. You can see that the thalamus is very large and it does a huge amount of very important roles within the general everyday functioning of the brain. We have to sum them up in just one word, it's filter. What the thalamus does is it filters out incoming sensory information. We don't have an awful lot of capacity within our cortex to process all of the sensory information that we experience all the time. And the thalamus decides what sensory information is allowed up our spinothalamic tract and onto our cortex and what sensory information stops dead at the thalamus. I'll give you a very simple example. If you've ever had to ring up a utility company or some other service to try and ask them a question about your bill or to make a complaint or to inquire about the service, sometimes now you have to talk to some sort of robot. It asks you various questions, asks you to press various buttons, and if as a result of the different combination of keys that you press, the robot decides that you're inquiry is sufficiently important to get put through to a human being, then the robot allows that to happen. That's basically what the thalamus does. It considers all of the sensory information that comes in, integrates it with sensory information coming from elsewhere, and decides what gets let up to the cortex. This results in what we might call the cocktail party effect. If you're in a room with a hundred other people and they're all having a conversation at a cocktail party, you might be talking to two or three people in front of you and you're perfectly able to focus on the conversation with them and you're able to filter out all of the other sounds that are in the room. But if somebody on the far side of the room suddenly says your name or says something that's important to you, then you are all of a sudden aware of it. What's happening very simplistically is that your thalamus is filtering out all of the irrelevant information from all around the room while you're having a conversation with people in front of you but it is still nevertheless paying attention to all the other sensory information if it picks up some salient sensory information from the other side of the room then it lets that through to your cortex and you respond to it you process it and so on that's very basically what the thalamus does the thalamus is the subject of other videos well, both in these teaching sessions and from my colleague Sam Webster. And I recommend you look at those for some detailed understanding of the anatomy and function of the, of the thalamus. All right, that's basically it. If you want to do some further reading on this, Siegel and Sapper is really good. Bear Connors and Paradiso is really good. Here are some of the references for the images that we've used. And most importantly, below the video, in the description below, there is a self-test with some formative MCQs to help you make sure you've got the most out of the learning from this video. All right, I'll see you in another video. Bye-bye.